So far, God has used metals to represent three kingdoms with perfect accuracy. We will now see why God chose iron to represent the fourth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. This is undoubtedly the empire of Rome. The secular historian Edward Gibbon makes this remarkable statement regarding her iron power. The arms of the Republic sometimes vanquished in battle, always victorious in war, advanced with rapid steps to the Euphrates, the Danube, the Rhine, and the ocean, and the images of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Rome was the largest and longest lasting of all preceding kingdoms. The iron in the image shows us that Rome will last until the end of Earth's history. However, there are two phases of iron. One is iron alone, the other is mixed with miry clay. This is fulfilled in the pagan Roman Empire and the papal Roman Empire. The political philosopher Thomas Hobbes makes this interesting observation in the 1600s regarding papal Rome. And if a man considers the original of this great ecclesiastical dominion, he will easily perceive that the papacy is none other than the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire, sitting crowned upon the grave thereof, for so did the papacy start up on a sudden out of the ruins of that heathen power. Throughout Roman history, Rome has had seven differing heads of government. The first were kings ruling the kingdom. Next, Rome became a republic and were headed by consuls, which are two elected individuals holding office at the same time. Each consul had veto power over his colleague. The third was called a decemvirate, which is a Latin term meaning ten men. These elected ten men held the Roman administration from 451 BC to 449. Another head was called a triumvirate, which is simply a coalition of three men in administration. Yet another ruler Rome had were dictators. Dictators were dispersed throughout the history of the Roman Republic. The most famous of these would be Julius Caesar, who was declared perpetual dictator in 45 BC. The sixth head of government, emperors. Emperors differ from kings because an emperor is a king of kings. For example, King Herod was subservient to the emperor of Rome. Also, an emperor rules an empire as opposed to a kingdom. After the Germanic tribes dominated Rome, Rome was finally ruled by popes. Still today, the seat of the Papal Roman Empire is located in the city of Rome. Rome began as a kingdom in around 753 BC. The first king was Romulus, who founded the city and named it after himself. The last king was an Etruscan king named Lucius Tarquinus Superbus. He was proud, tyrannical, and lost favour in the eyes of the people. It was said that Lucius was a source of the phrase, the tall poppy syndrome. According to Livy, Tarquin cut off the heads of the tallest poppies in his garden as an allegory to instruct his son Sextus to pacify a recently conquered enemy city by executing its leading citizens. This is one of the many stories which leads to the modern expression of tall poppy syndrome, to describe the phenomenon of tearing down individuals who rise too far above the majority. After Sextus violated a Roman noblewoman, the Tarquin family were removed from power and driven out by Roman aristocrats in 509 BC. At this time, the Roman Republic was formed. It was under the Republic that Rome came to be as strong as iron. Rome's expansion of territory commenced with the domination of the Italian peninsula. Rome then turned her eyes across the Mediterranean and fought three wars against their North African rival Carthage. These were known as the Punic Wars. 
It was during the Second Punic War that King Philip V of Macedon made an alliance with Carthage's general, Hannibal. This annoyed Rome, so Rome then took on these two powerful kingdoms at the same time. Carthage in the west and Macedon in the east. Rome first went to war with the Greek kingdom of Macedon in 214 BC and again in 200 BC. Rome then gained a decisive victory against the Greeks at Pydna in 168 BC, reducing Macedonia to a Roman province. By this time, Rome dominated much of the Greek territory. Although winning the wars against Carthage and the Greeks, Rome was financially and emotionally drained due to the loss of thousands of soldiers in bloody battles. So then how could Rome be as strong as iron if it was in this weak state? Well, one thing was clear, that an unprofessional citizen army was no longer adequate for an empire the size of Rome. Gaius Marius, a statesman and general of the Roman Republic, initiated a group of military reforms which profoundly shaped the future of the Roman power. Up until this time, the Roman army was made up of the wealthier, land-owning citizens of Rome. It was a seasonal army, so it was formed only when the need arose. Each soldier had to provide their own equipment. This all became a dutiful exercise to defend their land and increase the borders of the Roman Empire. But the policies of Marius, which greatly improved the military, hinged upon the selfishness of the human heart. Here are some of the reforms. In 30 BC, the Imperial Roman Army was established. All Roman citizens who joined the army, including the poor, were paid well for their service. Thus it became a career. For the first time, the Roman state provided equipment to all, giving uniformity to their force. Each soldier was equipped with a short iron sword called a gladius, a spear called a pilum, iron chest armor and a long rectangular shield. The soldiers were offered inducements and bonuses through spoils gained in conquering new territory. Retirement benefits in the form of land grants were also provided. This was very enticing for the landless poor citizens of Rome. They were required to enlist for some 20 years of full military service, but many served as long as 30 to 40 years, thus giving Rome a standing professional army. Can you see how these policies played on human greed? For many of the soldiers, it was all about personal gain. Look at what the prophet John the Baptist had to say to these Roman soldiers. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. The Roman generals had an iron grip on their soldiers, not only through the pleasure of personal gain, but through the use of extreme discipline. Here's an example. Decimation was a form of military discipline used by senior commanders in the Roman army to punish mutinous or cowardly soldiers. The word decimation is derived from Latin meaning removal of a tenth. A cohort selected for punishment by decimation was divided into groups of ten. Each group drew lots, sortition, and the soldier on whom the lot fell was executed by his nine comrades, often by stoning or clubbing. The remaining soldiers were often given rations of barley instead of wheat. When you compare these methods with dutiful service to a king or state like other kingdoms, you get a glimpse at the secret behind the strength of Rome. As a result of the military reforms made by Marius, the Roman generals, who were often political leaders, became too powerful within the Roman Republic. This caused the downfall of the Republic and the beginning of the emperors. The first emperor was Gaius Octavius, also known as Caesar Augustus. He became emperor in 27 BC. Augustus was the emperor when Jesus Christ was born. His successor, Tiberius Caesar, was emperor during Christ's crucifixion, resurrection and ascension. Augustus also played on the base nature of man through pleasure and fear in order to have an iron control not only over the military, but also over the populace of the Roman Empire. At this point in Roman history, unemployment was high. Large agricultural estates were supported by government grants. And these estates exploited slave labour from conquered lands. 
Small farms couldn't compete and gradually went out of business. This caused an influx of the unemployed into the cities. Augustus maintained control of these idle citizens through the pleasure and fear principle. The Emperor Augustus was well aware of this risk and was keen to keep the poorest plebeians happy enough and reasonably well fed so that they would not riot. He began the system of state bribery that the writer Juvenal described as bread and circuses. Free grain and controlled food prices meant that plebeians could not starve, while free entertainment such as chariot races and gladiators in amphitheatres and the Circus Maximus meant that they would not get bored and restless. Bribery it may have been, but it often worked. Bread and circuses gave the people an addiction to the Western lifestyle that Rome promoted. Rome built many entertainment centres in order to keep the masses amused. About 230 Roman amphitheatres have been found across the area of the Roman Empire. They were used for events such as gladiator combats, chariot races, venations or animal slayings and executions. Amphitheatres are distinguished from circuses, from hippodromes, which were usually rectangular and built mainly for racing events, and from stadia, built for athletics. Imperial amphitheatres comfortably accommodated 40,000 to 60,000 spectators, or up to 100,000 in the largest venues, and were only outdone by the hippodromes in seating capacity. Rome also employed capital punishment as a penalty for disobedience or rebellion. The Apostle Paul was charged before the Roman government for being a ringleader of a worldwide uprising. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Consequently, Paul was brought before Nero in Rome, and was beheaded for his Christian faith. Nero marks the beginning of the Christian persecution. These persecutions, beginning under Nero, about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or less fury for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of great calamities. As they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, informers stood ready, for the sake of gain, to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion, and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts or burned alive in the amphitheatre. Some were crucified, others were covered with the skins of wild animals and thrust into the arena to be torn by dogs. Their punishment was often made the chief entertainment at public fates. Vast multitudes assembled to enjoy the sight and greeted their dying agonies with laughter and applause. This policy of offering a combination of rewards and punishment to induce behaviour was a strength of Rome's iron power over the military and the masses. After Nero's death, another dynasty of Roman emperors arose, including Vespasian and his son Titus, who destroyed the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. Rome then continued for another 235 years until the reign of Constantine, which saw the empire divide, the capital city relocate, and a new state religion introduced. From Constantine onward, the Roman Empire was never the same again. Foreign elements were introduced, and the iron began to be mixed with miry clay. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. 